Um, as a Sangha, we just completed an eight-week course called Wisdom Mind and explored um, in a kind of structured way how to enact, inhabit, actualize in our own lives what we might call wisdom. And But for some of you, you know, there was a hiatus and some of you are new and um, others are now continuing and for me I'm just searching in myself, you know, how to continue this Dharma, ongoing Dharma dialogue that we have as this complex group, you know, of practitioners. So, you know, where, what to do, what to say, where to go next. That's just happening in me right now. Now, there's certain themes that I'm really interested in, and I can feel right now that I can't speak about all of them. Could take a year to unfold or something, you know. But I just want to start. Um, an underlying question, as those of you who have me, you know, have heard me speak before, is maybe the most fundamental question of my life, and I'm assuming that it's a question in your life too: is how to feel fully alive. Right? This is kind of like just a running question, theme for me. <clears throat> and I I believe for you too, um, you may phrase it differently or use different words or you have actually an unarticulated feeling about it. Um, how to be fully alive. How to live up to your own inmost request. Now, in relationship to that, I am really intrigued by what many people assert as a fact now, that the levels of anxiety and depression are rising in our society. It's like, why? I mean, you may experience more or less anxiety and depression in your own life, and you can treat that as a personal problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is something you are trying to solve. But aside from that, it's really um, remarkable that people who are studying the society objectively through the social sciences are reporting that more and more people are experiencing this. What is called anxiety and depression, I mean. We need to explore what that is, but... Okay, well, for now, that's good enough. Um, so, I'm wondering, you know, because of this, I'm wondering, is is this... Are we, should we treat this just as a personal problem, or should we um, look to the conditions of our society and the conditions under which we live that participate in creating this issue? So... You know what are the what are the um, structural elements of late modernity? We live in a certain kind of end time, I think. You know, M many people have thought this in over mm -hmm. the centuries. But um, I'll just to throw this out, I I just don't think that the way we function can continue much longer, maybe, you know, decades, but not um, infinitely. Because, um, you know, phenomena like global warming, it's showing us that there are limits to our idea of infinite growth and control. This is frightening, and I think that's also contributing to feelings of anxiety and powerlessness and depression and so forth. <clears throat> that things might not continue the way they have been for decades now, in, uh, not for everybody, but for the bulk of the society, 
pretty cushy way for us in the West. You know, we live really well. You might not feel that way, but I mean, just go centuries back and compare it to how people lived then. <clears throat> it's pretty warm in here right now. I want to say, you know, while it's cold outside, like we live um, sheltered lives comparatively. <clears throat> And on average. Um, and then, and this is how I want to lead today. I, there's this koan story I want to share with you that has accompanied me and my practice for many, many years. Um, and I want to just kind of get into this territory with this ancient story. And the story goes, for those of you who want to look it up, it's in um, a Dogen fascicle call, called Only a Buddha and a Buddha. You can always ask me, you know, if you want, to, don't find something and you want to look it up, just reach out. We can... So there you know, sort of in between other stuff, there's this story. And it goes, a long time ago, a monk asked a master, when hundreds and thousands or myriads of objects come all at once, what should be done? And the master replied, do not try to control them. And then Dogen um, comments, um, he says, what he means is that in whatever way objects come, do not try to change them. And he continues, Dogen's comment on this, do not understand the master's reply simply as a brilliant admonition, but realize that it is the truth. <clears throat> Whatever comes is the Buddha Dharma, and not objects at all. Even if you try to control them, they cannot be controlled. Whatever comes is the Buddha Dharma. It is not objects at all. And even if you try to control them, they cannot be controlled. Okay, that's the story. So I want to just look at the elements of what is presented here. A long time ago. I mean, why would you say something like that? I mean, it's in a, it's, you know, Dogen writes this, so for us it's clear it's a long time ago. He lived in the 13th century, and whoever he's talking about is further in the past. But Dogen in the 13th century already uh, said a long time ago. So what, you know, maybe he was talking about people who were exploring this in the 7th century or 10th century. We might just read past that and say, like, well, okay, long time ago. <clears throat> but uh, the feeling that comes up for me is like, hmm, this question that the monk asks is, uh, is a question that's been relevant for a long time. For centuries, this has been... Um, a relevant question to ask. And now, Dogen says, I'm presenting it to you again, as this dialogue between a monk, somebody who's exploring how to live, how to be fully alive, is dedicating his or her life to this exploration. I mean, we don't have to be monks, but maybe if we want to be serious about this exploration, we have to be committed practitioners. And we can ask ourselves what that means. 
But um, anyway, somebody, a committed practitioner or um, traveler of the way, is asking a master, you know, a spiritual friend who's more experienced or something that, you know, we can now say there is wisdom that's represented here. Um, and when you hear this story, when you hear a story or any koan, you want to see yourself both as this person inquiring and as the master. Don't just, I mean, first of all, don't say, oh, it's a monk out there who's asking the question. If this is going to make any difference to you, it's because you make yourself this person who is inquiring in this way. And don't treat the master as somebody who is external to you either. Because what is called master is a wisdom mind that you're not separate from. So maybe the answer surprises you, but the assumption should be that the answer is already something that's alive in you. So the monk, a monk asks, when hundreds, thousands, or myriad things come, What does that mean? I mean, I think he's asking about exactly this moment. <clears throat> so let's just look around. Let's just see this room, right? Is there, are there a hundred thousands or ten thousand things? Myriad means ten thousand. Easily. Just start. You know? Like, you're facing this way right now, but you know, there's the Buddha, there's the stand of the Buddha, there's the incense burner, candle, altar cloth, altar, you know, but then window, picture, you know. So hundreds of things. Stick. Oh, floor. Oh, different floor pieces. Microphone, glass of water. Where do you stop breaking it down? I mean, on the object level or the parts of the object level? Like, you want to count all the petals of the flowers on the altar? I mean, there's lots of petals in one flower. Dozens in one flower. <clears throat> or do you want to stop at the atom level? Or like, you want to count the quarks? When hundreds, thousands, or ten thousands of things come all at once. <clears throat> so he's saying, when they, these objects, <clears throat> come... Well, let's stay with that for a moment. How do they come? How do they come? They come through the senses. They come as uh, sights and sounds and smells and tastes and so forth. And they also come as... Uh, what I call the felt sense. They come as the feelings that are arising in you as you are experiencing them. So, when this situation... <laughs> um, and then he says, they come all at once. They don't come... So separately as uh, individual packets, they come as what I would call an undivided multiplicity. <laughs> there are many, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, 
but they're undivided. They come all at once. They make an impression on us together. I, let, let me just define something here. This way of how the world comes is, I call a situation. We can, we can use a different word, but that's the word I'm going to use now. A situation is an undivided multiplicity. A face is a situation. Because there's a lot going on in a face. A relationship is a situation. It's an undivided multiplicity of all kinds of aspects. Of memories, of things that are happening right now, of uh, ideas that we have for the future for that relationship, <clears throat> of the potentials that are in, in that relationship, of the things that are not possible. <clears throat> and a room is a situation. You know, maybe that, that's why I started with it. It's... it's uh, it's a it's a it's a physical event. <clears throat> so when hundreds and thousands and ten thousands of objects come all at once, you know we I don't want to take the mystery out of this statement, but yes, I do a little bit. It's basically, he's saying, when you are in a situation. <laughs> but he's very um, astute, actually, already in telling us that the situation is an undivided multiplicity. It's an inter interdependence, whatever situation you are in. It's a complexity. It's an innumerable complexity. It's like there's so much going on. And then, this is why I feel so, maybe so drawn to this, um, to this story and to this question. He says, what should be done? <laughs> what should be done when you are faced with complexity? How do you deal with it? How can you be fully alive in the midst of complexity? When hundreds and thousands and ten thousands of aspects of, you know, come all at once. <laughs> Isn't this the situation that we're in now and always? What should be done? How do you respond appropriately? How do you know what to do? What is right? This is, I would say, this is our question. Now, this monk, he or she, is uh, a long time ago asked about that. And, um, and the master replied, do not try to control them. Well, let me say something uh, general about, um, about Buddhist teachings. Buddhist teachings are antidotes. Just take any teaching. Take the teaching of everything is impermanent. Everything is impermanent is kind of looks like a description of the world. There's change, you know, everything's changing. You could say, can you, f I mean, if I want to teach you about impermanence, I can say, name something that's permanent. Tell me about what's permanent. Give me an example. And then the idea would be, you can't come up with anything. And then you have to admit, <laughs> everything is indeed impermanent. But um, in addition to being a description of the world, it's also an antidote to our desire for permanence. Because you feel threatened by change, you desire permanence. For example, you don't want to die. Or you don't want, 
your favorite things to break or fade or disappear. I don't want to be left by the person you love. That's desire for permanence, right? We have to always translate that so it's not just abstract. <clears throat> and when the teaching says everything is impermanent, it reminds you that this desire for permanence is, is just that. It's a desire. It's not how things actually are. So, um, do not try to control them is also an antidote to the desire for control. So when you hear um, a phrase like, do not try to control them, what's happening? You know, of course, in relationship to this question that was just asked, when the when tens and Tens and hundreds and thousands and ten thousands of things come all at once. What should be done? You can feel in yourself maybe the desire for control. We want to control situations. We can go into what that means. We want situations to have um, an outcome that is positive for us. Not just for us necessarily, but that's usually where it starts, you know. Like, I want this to be um, successful for me, for my plans, my interests. You could also want things to be positive for others. It's just, you know, what does it mean to control something? Um, I don't know. I did. It's not something I can say conclusively, but just to throw out some, you know, beginning of a definition of that is like to know something is to the beginning of control. You know, if you don't know anything, then you don't exert any influence over it, um, to make it predictable, to know it in such a way that it can be predictable. When I do this, this happens. This is what science is doing. So also, by bringing in science, we're bringing in modernity now, because a long time ago, when the, when the monk asked this question, there was not that kind of science that we have now. The level of control was way less. We live in a time where we live with much more ability to control. This is something I think we should really understand. And what it does to us, because the expectation of control also brings, you know, anxiety about failure. <clears throat> we think that the world is so much more, it could be so much more under control than a person a long time ago ever thought. I mean, they lived in a world in which so much was completely, it was clear that it was not controllable. Today, we're talking about engineering the weather. Imagine, imagine somebody, you know, a long time ago, thinking about that it would be possible to control the weather. That, that, didn't, that doesn't even come to mind as a possibility. But today, in the, in, in the age of global warming, we're talking about geoengineering. Controlling the climate. Wow. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> also, I think a long time ago, people lived just with, like, disease. It's just, it just comes, you know. It wipes you out. 
or you survive. You participate to a certain degree with disease, but it's not under your control. But today, if we live through a pandemic and politicians make the wrong decisions, we blame them for not bringing the pandemic under control. <clears throat> really? <laughs> I mean, just make that clear to yourself. Like The level of expectation of control that we have in our society right now is just immense. And why can we have it? Because science allows us to know more and more things and to make things more and more predictable. But the same extends to the self. Because we so, know so much more about the body and psychology and sociology, for that matter, of how people interrelate, we, um, um, this is another aspect of control, know, so things are knowable, predictable, and then they become manageable. We expect that we, you know, should be able to understand, know ourselves, predict, and manage ourselves in a way that is, I think, unprecedented in history. These, these societal conditions of increased expectations of controllability, I think, contribute a lot to anxiety. Anxiety is kind of like a, an emotional feeling manifestation of um, being faced with unpredictable outcomes. You know, you just don't know what will happen. But you're reaching into it with an expectation of control. You want it to go your way, but you can't be sure about it. Will this go well for me, you know? You can be anxious. Will this person accept me? Will they reject me? You know, it's uncertain. It's not controllable. But you would like to. No. In advance. Control it. Now, I don't think that this sense of anxiety, of wanting to control, has, uh, is different today than it was a long time ago. But I think that the societal conditions in which we have the, the idea and the expectation that more and more can be controlled is uh, changing the intensity of our feelings about you know, all kinds of stuff. I mean, just look at like how people are trying to date today. It's like it seems like everyone's just trying to do it over the internet. It's like you're trying to control the path of finding a partner by matching, you know, features. It used to be you just like run into somebody. And sparks fly. Okay. So it, was un, it was not... You, you, we, people didn't try to control it. I mean, romantic love and is, is already, you know, giving you more control because you can choose if you want to, you know, do something with these sparks. But in a long time ago, it was just arranged and you just, you know, really had no control. 
just get along with this person. Good luck. <coughs> so I'm not talking about good and bad. I'm just trying to bring out differences here. So I think if you if you just have to make do with whatever is like fate is giving you, you're not responsible. You're not responsible. You just like I was dealt this, you know. Uh, hand. Now I have to play with it. <clears throat> but if you think you are in control, you know, it's like, now you're responsible. I think this is just creating lots more anxiety. It's like, because you, you are responsible for the failure if it's not turning out well. It's not fate or God. It's like, it falls on you. If you don't get the vaccine, you are responsible for being sick. <laughs> you are refusing the measures of control that are being offered to you. <clears throat> okay, the Master says, when you are in a situation with complexity, do not try to control. So, let's look at Dogen's comment for a moment. He says, he, he the master, means, in whatever way objects come, do not try to change them. In other words, your initial mind should be to receive whatever comes and in whatever way it comes. Develop a mind in which you are, you know, can create stability in yourself to be able to receive through the senses and in your own felt body whatever comes. And do not have an initial mind of immediately wanting it to change, to be different than it is. Basically, don't approach the world with aggression. Don't say, this shouldn't be this way. You should be different. The pandemic should never have happened. This person is responsible. Allow for the world, for the, ten, for the hundreds and thousands of 10,000 things to come. I'll, I'll say something about letting it come. Most people do spiritual practice and they want to let go and let go and let go. <laughs> you know, we have to let go. But the I've said this before, the secret of letting go is to let it come. What you're letting go is not the stuff that comes. What you're letting go is your aggression toward what comes. So you let go of the aggression toward what comes, and you let the things, the 10,000 things, come and hit you. This is not attractive from the point of view of control. Anyway, but Dogen says, this is what he means. He means, in whatever way they come, do not try to change them. And don't understand the Master's reply simply as a brilliant admonition. Realize for yourself that it is the truth. There's a lot there, you know, I can only scratch the surface. Realize for yourself that the way you are in the world is through this fundamental openness of your senses and how you have a, what I call a resonant body that is vulnerable to what is occurring, you know, that is not in your control. Now, by vulnerability, I mean, yes, 
that we can get hurt. But I actually mean this fundamental condition that we're in of being resonant bodies, so that whatever happens actually elicits feelings here. This is what it means to be alive. You can't do anything about it. If you want to be fully alive, you kind of have to say yes to being this resonant, vulnerable body-mind. You understand? You can try to block that. You can say, don't come near me, world. Or I want to have be in control over just certain aspects that will come to me. And then you try to control them, right? This is the theme right now. The new, this is a way to try to control them, these, the complexity, the objects. But then you sacrifice your aliveness. We feel dead inside when we do that. If we refuse for the world to be a dangerous place, then we live in a boring world. You can feel safe, but you feel kind of dead because you're not alive. Because aliveness here means that you are in a res resonant relationship in which things can actually happen to you. And because things can happen to you, you need to find your own you know, it's a popular word right now, resilience or self-efficacy to respond to what is happening. If you say, I don't want these things to happen to me, then you also don't feel like an alive person who can deal with stuff. And I would say that's the condition of depression. Because it feels, I mean... Look, I'm not talking clinically. I'm just talking about a withdrawal from the world in which you don't want to, in which it feels better to not be engaged than to be exposed to this resonance that also presents a threat and a danger. Always. Yes, you can't avoid it. That just comes with the territory of being alive and being in this resonant exchange. <clears throat> I mean, look at how we have replaced adventure with vacation. I mean, true adventure is you go somewhere and you don't know what is happening and you might die. That's really adventure. That's adventure. But what's branded as adventure now is, you know, packaged vacation. <clears throat> go somewhere where you, can ex where you don't have your to-do list, <clears throat> right? Be free of your to-do list, but nothing really dangerous will happen to you. So you can return restored, but not transformed, because you had, didn't have to really go through anything. You were just like taking a break from your to-do list. Well, it's not like that that's bad, but it's, you know, it's, that's why vacation is so disappointing. Because what we really want to see happen is that we come into new situations that are really resonant and that uh, make us respond in ways that we didn't expect, right? That's what we want. That's adventure. But that's not what we really get. Because everything is already charted and, you know, and in, in, and in the end, we really actually want to be in control. I increasingly feel, I mean, there will come a time where we're not allowed to fly anyway because it's too, the carbon footprint is too high. So we might as well get used to, like, it's not necessary to go on a vacation because you cannot have it all here anyway. But that's another topic. <clears throat> So 
So back to Dogen's commentary. Um, what comes is the Buddha Dharma, he says, not objects at all. Now, this is a kind of obscure, but let's just say um, the Buddha Dharma is really this experience of right now, in this very moment, everything, the 10,000 things, are coming all at once, not as individual objects. You're always in a situation. Your whole life is there. Everything is happening, you know? It's actually the most adventurous situation you can be in. Don't have to go anywhere for that. It's all coming. <clears throat> it's the Buddha Dharma. In that same fascicle, there is a statement that says the entire earth is the Dharma body of the self. <clears throat> if you think about undivided multiplicity, you are coming out of this entire earth. The entire earth is collaborating to produce you. Here you are. You're not separate from it. It's all happening. It's the Buddha Dharma. It's not objects at all. It's not like individual things. Now, the reason I think it's stated this way is because when you divide the world into, uh, into objects, when you treat it as a constellation of things, then each thing becomes a point of control. Each thing becomes a point of aggression. I can deal with that thing as an, in an isolated way. That can be controlled. And that's true. You know, we're, this is actually really true. Realize that this isn't just a brilliant admonition, but that it is the truth. When you divide the world into objects, yes, that it, we can create segments of world that can, we can keep under control. But when you look at it as an undivided multiplicity, then you realize, even if you try to control them, meaning this complexity, it cannot be controlled. So, I have to wrap up, but I told you it's just too much to, and it's just scratching the surface. Um, Do not try to control them if you hear it as an antidote to your desire for control. The practice that comes out of that is to, to, um, to be this vulnerable, resonant body. This is what we do when we sit zazen. It's like you let go of your agenda of control and you become this alive, vulnerable, resonant body-mind that is that can be affected by the world. You can let things come. Everything, you know? 10,000 things. Memories. Painful memories. They can come. You don't have to make a wall. Well, we create the stability so that this can happen. Feelings can come. Thoughts can come. Don't try to have... Don't try to control them means also don't make your practice into like, I want to clear my mind of all thoughts so that there are no thoughts. This is the wrong goal in practice. It's like, can you sit with a stability, an openness, let's call it that, not an empty mind in that way, but an openness in which everything can come. To get to that, to get to, to, to maintain this kind of openness means we have to train attention so that maybe there is a certain path to doing that, a, myth, a methodical way to do that. So you have to first, like, you know, count your breath to put attention on a leash so that it can stay and it's not just running around like crazy. But ultimately, it's about having an open, wide, extended mind in which we can allow things to come, situations to be complex, uncontrollable.
in which we can come into resonance with our sensorial world. So, it's interesting that the Master doesn't say really what should be done. The monk asks, you know, what should be done in this situation? The Master says, let go of your attempt to control. Let them come. And there's a kind of trust involved here, which is the response of what should be done will come too. It will come out of that situation. This is, this is, I think, this paradox that we're living in in our time. We have a deep, deep longing for resonance, which ultimately isn't in our control. Right? Resonance is not in control. So we have a deep longing for resonance, and at the same time, we have a desire for control. And that desire for control is now, a days, reinforced by everything in our society. Science, technology, you know, administrative politics, <coughs> capitalism. So how to situate ourselves in this modern world in which there is a reinforcement, a constant reinforcement of the desire for control, how to situate ourselves in that with our longing for resonance, simple things, you know, to just be resonant with leaves that are moving in the wind or a face. All that for me is for me is is packed into this uh, reply. Do not try to control them. Affirm your longing for resonance. Dare to just be there as this open, vulnerable, resonant presence that you already are. <clears throat> 